the presentation. Okay, so we are very happy to have Thomas Van Riet here. He's coming from Belgium, uh, from the very comfortable, <laughs> uh, his very comfortable office. And he will talk about the festival and the bound. So as usual, if you have any questions, you can just amuse yourself and ask. And whenever you are ready, Thomas, please go ahead. I'm ready. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to, to speak on this occasion. Um, and indeed, let's make it an interactive seminar. So the topic of what I'm going to talk about touches upon various things of which many are outside of my comfort zone. So it's easy to, to squeeze me into the corner and I invite you to do so. And then I'm probably using my cards of Gerben and Miguel are coming to help me. OK, so Gerben and Miguel, make sure you're ready. Um, so what I will be talking about is based mainly on two papers, one from 2019 and one from uh, this year with, uh, as I said, with Miguel Herben, and the last one also with, with Kumrun. And <clears throat> I will start with a very quick uh, conceptual motivation for the topic uh, of the talk. And then I'll mainly introduce what is the FL bound uh, and why I think it could very well be correct. Uh, and then I'll just discuss two kinds of applications. One I would call pure pheno, and the other one I would call string pheno. Maybe you could say that string pheno is the purest kind of pheno, but I guess you know what I'm trying to say. And then I'll end with my conclusions. Okay, so in terms of motivation. So I guess I don't have to explain this audience that one of the difficulties with the Swamp Land program is what you can see on top of the slide here. So on the one, if you would draw a line of, you say, you know, the trustworthiness or the usefulness of a swamp land statement, they tend to sort of go in the opposite direction. And it's not bad per se of the swamp land, it's just a difficulty for if you want to work on the topic, especially if you want to involve pure phenomenologists. And so a few examples of, I would say, um, swamp land constraints, which I, I should say constraints instead of conjectures at some point, because the, um, the evidence has you know, been mounting so much that I think, say, the no global symmetry statement is essentially became you know, something we all trust, probably the same with the electric uh, weak gravity conjecture. And I think on the other side are the decider conjectures. They are the most heuristic in, in the way they are sort of argued for. Um, and of course, they are very they are potentially very useful uh, and even measurable. Okay, so this is a very famous um, tension that we are having. Well, this talk involves the sitter space. Um, and of course, there's an issue with the sitter space, which I tend to always give this slide for. So what is the status of the sitter space in string theory? And it really depends on who you talk to. And the opinions of the experts range from, you know, we should stop having this discussion. You know, it's clearly there. We've done the things, you know, the papers have been written and other papers say, other people saying no. It's like very unclear uh, whether we can trust all of the approximations, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm gonna use for my talk is I'm gonna assume the sitter space is, you know, allows some kind of UV completion, uh, but I am, I think that the majority of people working on the topic, whether or not you, you like the swamp plant or not, would probably agree with the following, uh, two statements about the sitter vacuum string theory. If they exist, they will not exist in the parametric controllable regimes. And the word parametric is important. So there's no number I can scale up to get control, scale up arbitrarily much. Another thing is that if there is a sitter landscape, the vacua are at best metastable. I think these are two statements we probably all agree upon. Okay. so. Concerning extension of having useful uh, swampland um, bounds, conjectures, I think the more useful they are, the more strongly the IR is related to the UV in those connections. And the moment I'm thinking about the sitter space cosmology, then there's a natural IR cutoff, which is the Hubble uh, radius, so one over H. Okay. And with regard to the Hubble radius, there at least say, Outside of the swampland context, there are two cases where I know, I mean, there are many, but for me, two, two important uh, situations in which we notice that this IR cutoff can have an important implication. So one of them is, is, um, is what we call the CKN bound. It's a paper from 98, which has 
been given lots of attention in the phenomenology uh, community. And for a reason I do not yet understand, it's sort of ignored in the swampland community. Although it's officially, I think, maybe one of the very first swampland conjectures ever. It's just not called that way. So the CK unbound, what is it saying is that if I have a theory with a UV and an IR cutoff, and let me call the IR cutoff L in terms of a length scale, then the UV cutoff should be smaller than the square root of MP over L. Okay. Um, this is, if this is correct, this is a highly non trivial link between the ultraviolet and the infrared. And in the cosmological case, of course, L is, should be the Hubble uh, radius. Another interesting um, effect of the sitter space, say, on, on, on potentially quantum gravity is when you look at the Reggie trajectory of strings in the sitter space. Okay, so we know in flat space, we have the standard relation between mass and spin. And what happens in the sitter space is that the Reggie trajectory makes a rather striking turn um, in you know, the space of mass versus uh, spin. Um, and you could really wonder, you know, how do, does this influence the way we think about UV comp completion in, in, um, in the sitter space? Because you know, an important part of UV completion is to have a tower of massive states. Uh, and maybe this tower works very differently in the sitter space. So maybe there's something non-trivial going on in the sitter space at the moment. You are probing the, the sitter horizon. Okay, these are very vague statements that I'm just showing here, but they form for me personally, a sort of a motivation to look at what we are looking. For the rest, I don't have much more to say about these two statements here, uh, but I wanna come back to the CKN bound uh, later maybe in my conclusions, because funny enough, the bound we will be obtained, we obtain is the exact other way around. Okay, this is highly confusing. Okay, so what I really want to talk about is the- Alan, can you go back to the previous slide? So what can you <laughs> explain to me? I missed, what does this hour mean? Uh, L, the blue, uh, what is the, so what are they expecting you explaining? And the left is the what? The rigid trajectory in the city space? Uh, sorry, Eran, are you talking about the connection between the, these two? Um, uh, what are these pictures? Sorry, I just missed what these pictures are. Was the, this is the a mass picture. versus the spin. Uh, what what uh, does a shaded region? Uh, it's when you violate the Higuchi bound, sorry. Right, so if, sorry, I should have, I should have said it, so my apologies. So the shaded region is a forbidden region for unitarity, for the Higuchi bound. So the mo if the trajectory, would be a straight line as in flat space, at some point you violate the Higuchi bound. And this doesn't happen in the sitter space because the trajectory makes a turn. Ah, okay. Okay, thanks my, for the explanation. My apologies, yeah. No, okay, so, thank you. Okay, the FL bound. Um, in order to define the FL bound, let sorry, us sorry, first look at a clarify, simple- I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand this inequality that you wrote. Um, this seems like it's not true in ADS CFT, is that right? The CK unbound? Yeah, but maybe I'm not doing the algebra correctly in my head, but if I write this as saying that lambda, U, this looks to me like it says that lambda UV has to be less than M Planck times L Planck divided by L ADS to the one half. Um, so that says that lambda UV has to be much smaller than the Planck scale by a, a factor that by power of N so you're using the ADS radius as a- Yeah, I want to say, yeah, I want to call L the ADS radius. Then, then I get an inequality that looks like it's obviously not correct. Maybe, maybe we should not think of the ADS radius as sort of an IR cutoff because we know what happens beyond that radius. In the sitter space, it's kind of different. Well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, well, I guess it depends what we mean by an IR cutoff. I, mean, I don't even know who CK and N are, so I don't know what the motivation uh, is. Sorry, I should have, yeah. yeah. I was surprised to learn that this is a paper with more than 1,000 citations. It's Cohen, Kaplan, and Nelson. Uh, I should have put the okay. reference there. Yeah. Uh, so what is bound, actually, it's interesting you mentioned ADS-CFT because it's completely inspired by ADS-CFT. So roughly what the, bound is, what the bound should mean is the following statement. So first of all, we know that we cannot, uh, in a theory with gravity, if we just naively think of quantum field theory with a UV cutoff, then at some point, um, you know, if you count the uh, entropy of a field theory, you get completely the wrong answer because you would violate uh, the Bekenstein bound, right? 
So it was already known that you somehow should, you know, try to solve this. And there's an inequality that relates the UV to the IR so that you don't get into, you know, that if you don't go far enough in length scales, you will not hit the Bekenstein bound, okay? So what oh. CKN wanted to do is to make this precise in a way that is more physical. They said, what if we make sure that all quantum states are always um, living inside their Schwarzschild radius? So if you make that precise and you check what that means at the level of IR versus UV cutoff, you get this equation. That's the that's point of their paper. And the motivation was to have a criterion that is resolving the issue of you know, naive entropy counting in field theory and how to not get into a conflict with the Bekenstein bound. So in ADS CFT, the resolution of that is that black holes that are of order the ADS radius or bigger behave differently than black holes that are small. There's a phase transition, yeah. Maybe that is the answer to your question, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, that, but then I'm kind of skeptical. I mean, without telling us what kind of IR cutoff they have in mind, I mean, that, that'll be true. I, I mean, that'll probably be true for any kind of IR, IR cutoff, right? Yeah. So, so I, I don't, yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of skeptical. I, I mean, it's the first I heard of it, so I have to think about it more. Okay, it's, yeah. It's well, <laughs> clearly square root of MP over IR is much smaller than MP. Otherwise, it's a trivial statement. Yes. Right, right, right. But I mean, uh, you know, we have examples in string theory where the cutoff is of order MP, right? So. Uh... No, sorry, Daniel. Like, for instance, if you think of stuff like ADS forecast as seven, yeah, you'd say the, the effective cutoff, because there's no scale separation, you could say that the cutoff is of order of one over the ADS length. And in that case, the bound would be marginalized habitat, right? No, that, that, was, that was what I was thinking of, was the cutoff with the ADS scale. Oh, oh. Gravity in a box. Oh. Yeah, that, but it's weird. You get an inequality that looks weird if you think of it as the ADS. No, but what Miguel is saying, if you use that as your cutoff scale and you really think in terms of, I thought you were thinking in terms of 10 dimensional supergravity. If you think in terms of lower dimensional supergravity, then this is essentially saying, you know, what some people would call the no scale separation conjecture. Um, oh, which I don't believe, so, okay. No, no, that, uh, I understand, but yeah. No, but I can invite you to, to I mean, it's, it's actually a quite surprising paper, the CKN paper. I, okay, well, yeah, it's I only five pages, it. you should really look at it. I think it's, it's okay. quite, yeah. I, I don't think I fully understood it, so clearly, um, yeah. Maybe I come back to CKN later if that's okay, yeah. Um, but thanks for the question. I clearly have much to understand there. Um, so what I want to talk about now is a very specific effective field theory coupled to gravity, which is, you know, gravity in a certain dimension D with a Maxwell field and then a potential energy, which I've called V. If this potential energy is constant, say it's just a cosmological constant or I have a minimum of my scalar potential, then this would determine my Hubble radius in the following equation. I guess we all know this. So, if we for a moment forget V, or we say that you know the cosmos constant is small enough, the universe is big enough, we can essentially apply the electric weak gravity conjecture as we know it in flat space. And of course, there will be tiny corrections due to the cosmos constant. But the bottom line is that there should always be some kind of a super extremal state. Okay, not 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 necessarily a black hole, but a super extremal state. Um, and what is on the Fasina Lente bound? I immediately want to give it, and then I'm going to give the arguments for it. It's actually the other way around. So the weak gravity bound is saying that, you know, the charge of a particle with respect to its mass has to be large enough for some charge state. Fasina Lente is kind of the exact opposite statement. It says that all charge states in your theory have to obey the following bound on the mass. The mass should be large enough in terms of the charge, but there is also the Hubble scale in this particular uh, form. Okay, later, and I've done it already here, I will make this squiggly line disappear and change it by a fixed number. Okay, so actually I've done that here. So imagine we are in 4D and we talk in terms of the fine structure constant alpha, according to this equation, we get actually for the weak gravity particle, we would get a, a window where it should be. It should be three, be, be in between those two scales. Oh, so this, right? this bound is meaningful only for when V is positive. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. I should have said. Yeah. That. So, for example, Daniel cannot come back and say that this contradicts with ADS shift if it's wrong. No, but I was talking about the CKN bound. And, and, and this is not exactly the CKN bound. This is our bound. Yeah. But indeed, I cannot have a discussion about uh, the Fasina Lente bound in anti-receiver space. Yes, indeed. 
Okay. So I'm going to give two arguments for it. And the, fir the first argument is the one we originally uh, wrote down in a paper in 2019. And the first argument comes from looking at the quantum dynamics of a charged black hole in sitter space. So what I've done for you, I've given you the general equation for a charged riser neutron black hole in the sitter space in Hubble units. This is why you don't see an L squared here. I've absorbed all the Hubble units, right? So my mass is sort of rescaled to G over L, the same for my charge, etc. Okay, just to get a very simple formula. And Black holes in the sitter space are a little bit more tricky than black holes in flat space. For instance, there's a cosmological horizon. So entropy always takes into account the horizon of the black hole plus the entropy of the cosmological horizon. Now, the bottom line is that if you look at the diagram of solutions in the sitter space, there's something peculiar happening, OK? So let's for a moment believe we're in flat space. What do we have in flat space? And we just have a straight line, which is a special line, and we call it the extremal line. It goes to infinity, and all black holes have to be to the right side of this line, right? It's just a statement that black holes cannot be over extremal. What happens in the sitter space, that is not true anymore. It's only partially true. We also have um, a maximum amount of mass and a maximum amount of charge in the sitter space, simply because the sitter space is a finite uh, space, and the black hole has to fit within the cosmological horizon. So the situation is, is much more in, interesting, in fact. Okay, so what do we have? We have the following, we call it the shark fin. In the QM space, there's this very sharp region here, and all black holes lie within this region here. So this boundary, we still call it the extremal black holes, and this boundary, we call it the charged Narai black holes. And this point, you probably know, is just the Narai black hole. It's the largest um, uncharged black hole you can have in the sitter space. Is the arrow opposite? Yeah, uh, yeah. sorry. I have this weird thing of saying, look, here is an Ari black hole. But yes, the arrow should be, <laughs> here is an Ari black hole. Yes, thank you. Um, OK, so what is also special is this orange line. All right, so what is this orange line? These are the black holes for which the uh, temperature of the black hole equals the temperature of the outs of the of the environment, right? Whereas the extremal line in the sitter space, so that is a Q equal M line essentially. The extremal line in the sitter space starts deviating a little bit if you go really to large charges and masses, and that's where I really demand that the temperature is exactly zero. Okay, so that's a that's a tricky difference with with, um, with flat space. So, so just to clarify, um, everywhere outside of this blue line, is there a naked singularity? So we should only be thinking about inside of the blue line, sort of below it? Exactly. So whenever you call it a, a sensible black hole, yes. Yes, indeed. Here, there's essentially, you should think of this as a, as a crunching solution. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's a very good point. So this is, I mean, you can move from this region smoothly to into this region, right? Yeah, but all those regions are that whole region is bad in some sense. Yeah, so. it's it, exactly. Yeah, uh, just wanted to make sure I understand the terminology. So, lukewarm means that the temperature of black hole is the same as that of the environment, the zeta space. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, then you have sort of thermal equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And in flat space, that of course doesn't happen because the environment is at zero temperature and these two lines coincide with each other. So, so extreme of black hole is actually unstable in uh, getting. Mass, yes, and why is that the case? In the sitter space, such a black hole would eat the sitter, uh, the sitter radiation, mm -hmm. right? And it would move uh, to this line, actually. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so black hole thermodynamics is very funny in, uh, in the sitter space and interesting. Okay, okay sorry. So, yeah. Uh, this is maybe just a random observation, but maybe you have some thoughts. But this line is really reminded full to the Rigge trajectory that you show for the string in the sitter, right? This turn, do you know that it? Yeah, yeah. So of course, something? of course, it's. Uh, this is, I mean, the behavior is similar in the sense that, it's in in the sitter space, things can have only maximal uh, charge, maximal mass because it has to fit inside, and it's the same with. Uh, I think the sharp turn is the moment the string would actually be longer than uh, they would not fit into the Hubble um, uh, horizon anymore. So it's kind of always the sim same in spirit. The reason things make a turn, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So also I should have mentioned on the previous slide, these blue solutions, so the edge, they're all ADS2 cross S2 solutions. 
Here, the right side are DS2 cross S2 solutions. And the top here is very peculiar. That's a Minkowski two cross S2 solution. It's called the ultra cold point. So for those people that really love things like, um, you know, ADS2 and JT gravity and all of that, I mean, there must be something interesting going on, I think, with this diagram in terms of, you know, two dimensional gravity. You really go continuously from ADS2 cross S2 to Minkowski two cross S2 to the Sitter two cross S2. So I think there's a lot to be learned um, if we study here the ultra cold point more. Okay, so what were the principle that, one of the principles that led us to the weak gravity uh, conjecture, the electric weak gravity conjecture, it's a statement that if I'm living close to this line here, to the blue line in flat space, what I want to happen is that I can, my quantum dynamics brings me inside, okay? That's essentially, if you like, the weak gravity conjecture. You want extremal black holes to be to be able to decay. Okay, and so what we're gonna do in the sitter space, you should ask exactly the same. But I think, as Hiroshi already mentioned, in the sitter space you get it automatically. Okay, so you know if you're here in the sitter space on this uh, extremal line, you don't need to invoke the weak gravity conjecture in order for the particle to go in uh, for the black hole to decay because it eats anyhow uh, the sitter uh, radiation. So it's less obvious how you actually go about and really write down the, ar argue for the weak gravity conjecture in the sitter space. But then again, what it probably means is that you have to go inside of this diagram fast enough. So that's clearly a line of research, I think, which has not been fully investigated, you know, how you, how you make the argument exactly. Yeah, there is so, one difference though, because uh... If uh, yeah, simply flat space, you have to emit charged particle. But here, you don't have to emit charged particle to get to loop one. Well, that's because it's not actually decaying. It's getting bigger, right? So I mean, <laughs> it's the opposite. It's undecaying. Well, but also, there's another effect. I mean, it's true what you guys say. There's also another thing that is happening. So, um, in um, the, so kinem so if you're in flat space, kinematically, you cannot have a Schwinger effect if your particle is not super extremal. Right, because the, the sum of gravity and Coulomb force is still going in the other direction. But in the sitter space, it's always possible, right? I mean, if, if the particle goes far enough, it will essentially always, there's a particle that can always tunnel out if it really tunnels out very far, right? Due to the cosmic repulsion. So that's another reason. Um, yeah, that's another effect. I mean, for that matter, we don't even really know what we mean by saying that we have a charged particle in the sitter space, right? Because the at least if you think about the spatial slices, the total charge has to be zero, right? So yes. It's this confusing thing that there has to be another black hole of opposite charge on the other side. And that, that is certainly the case in these diagrams. I haven't written it. Very confusing. Yeah. So what do you even mean by Q actually, right? I mean- uh, So I it's know. a very good point. So here I'm talking about, about there's a dipole. So you're absolutely right. So all the, if you look at the, glo the global Penrose diagram, there will be a black hole with the exact opposite charge at the other uh, side of the sitter space. Yeah. Right, so here I'm focusing on one, um, on the static patch on one side of that diagram. But eventually they may wander around and meet each other and then there won't be any black, you know, then there'll just be a big neutral black hole. I don't know, right? I mean, it's very confusing. I, I've never understood. It. No, but it's not that they're unstable, that, uh, that, that they, that they uh, if you kick them, that they, they're gonna meet each other. Um, well, that's not gonna are, happen. Uh, well, if they're small, I guess, then they're in, maybe they're in different horizon patches, but uh, if they're big, you know, I, I, I have no idea. No, the, I think the global solutions for, for these guys are actually no. no. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, yeah, in the same way that the Schwarzschild one is, is known, but then we're talking about effects that go beyond just the classical solution, right? When you talk about pair production and quantum fluctuation. Well. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, no, there's lots, I mean, many things are not fully understood, for instance, but I think Miguel knows more or Herman, like it's unclear what the instantons are that should produce um, the solutions on this line, the charged NRI solutions, for instance, right? If I, if I get them through tunneling, um, these things are unclear, I think are a bit unclear. Yeah. Well, you, I think those ones on the right side, you just have to view them as cosmologies. You, you can't create yes. them starting with not having them and then creating them, right? They have to kind of always be there. In some no, sense, no, no, no. Right? You can create them from the vacuum. Like there's an explicit thing. No, but, I, no, but I, I, when you say that, I think you mean they were always there, right? Like, I don't think you can be in a situation where there's some time slice where there aren't any black holes. And then there's later there's some, because, because uh, it, it would have to, you know, they have to go outside the horizon, right? Like, 
but so they are nucleated. So there's an ingredient instant on that mediates, you know, per production by these guys. And it fits with the thermal picture of the city of the thermal bath. You could I know, but I, I would say there that's part of the Harlow Hawking state. I, I mean, maybe this is semantic. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I would say that that's good, but you're just putting them there in the Harlow Hawking state to begin with. Okay, okay, okay. For, yeah, they're part of the thermal state, but it's it's yeah. just that there's an instant on. And indeed, when they are per produced, when they are large, the, the large charts, they are already per produced in two different static patches. So they are, so they are per produced outside of the horizon of each other. Yeah, I just say there's some branch of the Hurdle Hawking state that has them there. Sure, so. sure, sure. Like maybe if you're measuring the vacuum, at some point you'll find yourself in this thing. If you can right. measure outside the horizon, yeah. Good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at this branch and I'm going to demand, just like what I did here, that the quantum evolution behaves well. And what do I mean by behaving well? Is that if I have a black hole here, it's going to move inside and it's not going to move outside. That's the only thing I'm going to demand. And that by itself, you can imagine, no? if I just look at the sum of Hawking radiation and Schwinger radiation, demanding that I go inside instead of outside, is going to constrain the spectrum of my theory. And that is our, that's essentially where DFL bound came, came about for the first time. Okay, so what have we done in this old paper of 2019? We did a semi-classical analysis of how charge evolves in time, how uh, mass evolves in time. You get a coupled set of first order differential equations and you try to construct the flow. You get, you know, symbolically a picture like this, right? However, this picture is not as nice. So, this picture would be the ideal situation because if you look at this picture, what eventually happens? I start with some state and if I wait long enough, I end up in empty de Sitter space, which has the highest entropy. Is so the, you say the good, curvature finite everywhere on the Narayi, Narayi line? Yes, very good. So even at this sharp point, what happens here is that, so the S2 is still a finite size, but here, yeah, the, the curvature of the base space really is, um, Flat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And along the Nariai Na Na line, too. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. these are all very smooth solutions. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, this is the ideal situation. This means perfect thermalization back to the Cedar space, which is something that you would expect. Now, unless you violate the Fasina Lente bound. So, if you violate the bound that I showed you before, what can happen if you're probing this region very closely, you see that you're actually moving outside. Okay, so similar to what we demand for weak gravity, we say, look, let's make sure that doesn't happen. And this gives us the bound in the other direction that I just wrote you down, okay? Interestingly, there's a completely orthogonal argument for the Fessina Lente bound, which we only discovered later. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So uh, in the previous slide, that evolution, was it for a single charged particle? Well, actually, so it depends on what you put in J and tau. Right, so you can have right. a whole spectrum and you can have a whole tower, yes. And of course, what dominates in this tower is the lightest charged particle, right? And so what you can show is that if there is one of them violating the Fessina Lente bound, if you have a more complicated spectrum, it is you can actually reach the outside region. So even if you have a single charged particle that is massive, uh, is not one of your light particles, you. You say that single, even that can you repeat that a, a single charge if you have a if you have a single particle that violates the the fl bound that could take you outside of the triangular region even if it's really massive even if it's really massive no if it's really because it will I, obey no then it will stay inside of course i see so because so the reason i'm asking because in, in the earlier slides i think you wrote that the fl bound is something that you expect to be true for every um particle in your spectrum no every charge particle right every charge particle in your spectrum but but if the uh, uh but i would expect this radiation this evolution for the black holes to be dominated by the light particles so if there's a really massive particle that violates the fl bound no but if it's going to be really massive right mm -hmm. then it for sure obeys the bound uh why the because the bound says that it should be massive enough no, no, no. I mean, I mean, with with fixed. Um, so you mean so, a, a very uh, massive I mean, particle with a very large charge. With with ve very large charge, yes. Yeah. Then we're so, almost talking like, what if this what if this black hole decays by nucleating away uh, other black holes, right? So this process would be very much suppressed with respect to just standard light particle um, um, radiation. 
Exactly. So if you have a massive particle that, um, I see. So, I, so uh, if, if you have a really massive particle that violates the FL bound, then the, the amplitude of this getting radiated is suppressed, right? So we, we can't really say that this will take us to the outside region. So it's okay for the FL bound to, to be violated for this. So the, right. the statement is really, there is a particle that satisfies the FL bound, namely the light particles. You no, it, light it is particles. much, no, 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 it's, it's a stronger statement. So I think I understand what you're playing with. So imagine, you know, if multiple species, uh, what if I can make sure that one of them violates the bound, mm -hmm. but in such a way that the combined effect will not uh, violate exactly. the bound? That I'm not, I'm not sure. So first of all, you have to, I mean, you have to really, these things are almost linear, right? In masses and charges. Um, I'm not sure. I would say this would still be forbidden because there's still, you know, uh, quantum mechanically, it can always happen that, that the system decides for a moment to just choose one decay channel, right? And then I would move outside still, right? I mean, all of these things are just, you know, probabilities and I can somehow the system says, look, I'm just going to now decay using, you know, one quantum channel. Then I would still move outside of the diagram. Okay. So if you, if, you, sorry, if you move out of this diagram, then you just have a singular, isn't that just a singular solution to the theory? You get a crunch, you get a crunch in cosmology, right? Yeah. So like typically if we have some theory and that theory has a singular solution, we would just say the solution doesn't make sense. Not that the theory doesn't make sense. Of course. Isn't that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, are you not that somehow so demanding a solution and forcing this, forcing right. the so, theory <laughs> to be no, such no, a no. So, so Aaron, if, 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 if I would say so, then I would say we have a proof for the Festina Lente bound instead of we have an argument in favor of it, right? So the way we think about it is that, okay, we're just copying what happens here. We don't regard it as a foolproof, but we're saying, what well, maybe, you know, this thing, you should think of it as a closed box system. It should thermalize, right? And if, if that's our expectation, then you would expect it goes back here, right? And what you're saying, well, I'm okay with these crunches, right? But okay. let me give, I mean, I, can, yeah, I, mean, I, again, I don't you have to find that many singular solutions to GR and things like this, and you know, and the theory, and you just say the, these solutions don't make sense. Why, why change the theory? It seems that you are forcing the theory by the, to, to have a certain solution existing rather than, that's not how we usually do physics. No, a crunching solution I can, I can easily find for any theory, right? The question is whether I can evolve yeah. from a very good, well-defined configuration to a finite time in something that has a crunch and sort of a naked singularity that I can essentially start probing. But if you think the about the, the work that has been done in ADS by Horowitz and Santos, then you actually see that demanding, you know, not a violation of cosmic censorship, you end up with the electric weak gravity conjecture, right? So it's very similar in spirit. So I, I have a, sorry, I have Thanks. another question. So, um, so I've thought about this less when Q is not zero, but when Q equals zero and you're at the Nari I point, what happens from the static patch point of view is that you kind of, there's no operational distinction between the black hole horizon and the cosmological horizon. There's kind of a symmetry between them. So is right. that true also when you go up along this line to non-zero yes. Q? Yeah. yeah. And so, but so then like from the point of view of the static patch point of view, I guess I always thought that there should be a process where, where somehow, you know, you have the, you have a very big black hole that you reach the scenario I point, and then actually there's some fluctuation and now the cosmological horizon shrinks down and what used to be the black hole horizon is now the new cosmological horizon. So is what you're saying that that's not allowed? Is that the principle? You're saying that this point is unstable? Right, that's what you're trying uh, to say by fluctuation. Well, yeah, so at M equal, I, I don't know exactly what stable means, but I mean, there's a symmetry. So, I mean, to me, at least at Q equals zero, there's a symmetry, but, right. you know, between getting bigger and getting smaller if you start with right. an RI solution. So when you get bigger here, you crunch, the system crunches. When you get yeah, smaller, you just evaporate back, you evaporate back to the zero space. You should think of this point as a pure Narai point. As some yeah. kind of a, you know unstable solution is the top of the of top of the hill, and the question is whether you're going to move left or right. Yeah, no, I know, but the one where you go to the right is the one where the black hole and the cosmological horizons exchange, right? And the one that you you used to call the black hole horizon becomes the cosmological horizon. But that, that's not really, I think, correct how to think. Of it. It's not that these things change, uh, and that this, there's again a, a you know kind of a 
an RI kind of solution. No, then the system really becomes, um, then you've put more mass in the sitter space than is possible. Can I, can I maybe can maybe say quickly? So uh, Daniel, the process you're talking about is different than the one that, that we're okay. worried about, which only happens at not zero Q. So at zero Q, you could just you could pair produce from the vacuum to the to the narrow, neutral narrow solution, and then as you're saying, there can be small fluctuations, and it could you know it could go be fine either way. Like maybe what used to be one horizon, it becomes the other, and vice versa, right? Yeah. What we're saying is that if you go sufficiently high enough in the in the in the narrow branch, like you know in some random point in there, yeah. uh, the situation that you have is you have the sitter two process two supported by an electric field. Now, if you have very light charged particles, precisely particles that violate the stenal end bound, you per produce them and you, you get rid of this electric field instantaneously. And the solution is different. The solution in the, in the charge narrow branch is really supported by the electric field. So what you get from that, we actually show this, what you get is really like a crunch. It's, it's yeah. not the mild thing where you could just go one way or another. The mild thing that could go one way or another is what you get in the case when you satisfy uh, the festinal antibound because then everything is like adiabatic evolution and just like in the neutral case it can go one way or the other way so it could well, yeah thanks Miguel that's what, what Miguel is saying is that yeah. you immediately if you screen away the electric field you immediately jump from what you know what you would say this point immediately to this point and that's way worse than a small fluctuation well okay I don't know yeah uh, but I, I, I can I can sympathize with anybody saying, look, I don't think this is a this is a yeah. proof of anything. Um, but I would say, look, we are we are saying there are two kind of theories. Call it that way, okay? There are theories for which the sitter space, for which black holes in the sitter space thermalize back to the sitter space, and there are theories for which they do not. Okay, we suggest, sort of inspired with the weak gravity conjecture, which said that you should not go to this side. Okay, since this side is connected to that side, we say, look, no, why don't in spirit we ask the same? We ask that the things can just thermalize back to nothing, you know, to, to the sitter space and radiation. Okay, then we get a bound on our spectrum, right? You could say, well, fa fair enough. I don't think that that's, that's a genuine argument for me to, to buy it as a swamp land bound. Okay, I hope to convince you in the rest of the talk that it actually starts making sense. It's just because in the other case, you know, the original yeah. weak gravity was designed to prevent an instability, but now you're sort of trying to, sorry, sorry, the original weak gravity was designed to allow an instability, right? Yes. But this is designed to prevent an instability. So, so it seems somewhat different to me. I don't, but anyway, why don't you go ahead? Oh. Um, right. So here's the second argument, how you get to the same bound. And this bound comes from the, this argument uses the weak gravity, the magnetic version of the weak gravity conjecture, which has a, the effective field theory cutoff is bounded by M Planck, but then, you know, there's also a factor of G. Okay, so one way to, to arrive at this uh, inequality is to say that a monopole of unit charge has to be larger than its corresponding black hole solution, right? So also here in spirit is very similar to the CKN bound, okay? You want quantum states to be larger than their corresponding black hole solution. Now, in the sitter space, and this was pointed out a long time ago, right after the original weak gravity paper, in this paper, which is somehow ignored, that in the sitter space, or you know, they also made the case for anti the sitter space, we have to demand that the monopole can actually also fit into the sitter space. Should be smaller than its corresponding Narai solution. What does it mean in an equation? So you go back to my original slide where I showed you the black hole warp factor, right? This is the guy in front of time. I put a minus here and I've done times R squared to just make our life simple. And then I get the following polynomial, right? And what we demand is that if you look at this polynomial, note that this is negative, right? I want this polynomial also to be negative the moment I evaluate it at the monopole radius. Okay, that's essentially the same as this statement, but then in an equation. So if you analyze what this, in, what this equation would entail us, let me just remind you of the quantities that appear in this polynomial. There's Q tilde, which I will explain, and there's M tilde. So these are renormalized masses. And keep an eye, you know, this is my magnetic charge and I called it Q tilde, right? So if you look at the equation, this is in the end what we get. We get two bounds, right? And you will see that these bounds behave very differently depending on this value Q tilde which is my magnetic charge. So if this thing becomes, if this thing is small, if I'm looking at small black holes, I essentially just find the standard magnetic weak gravity conjecture with tiny corrections to it, okay? 
But uh, then again, I also see that this thing, you have to be careful for the square root of not changing sign. So there's actually a, a maximal value for Q. If you go close to this maximal value for Q, you get the, the inequality is bounding you in the other direction. And so here I wrote down this maximal charge. And what you find for this to not happen after rewriting things a bit, you find that the coupling of your theory, the U1 coupling has to be larger than this dimensionless number. Okay, there's another way of rewriting this. This is the same as demanding that the dark energy scale is below your cutoff scale, right? If you believe that the magnetic weak gravity conjecture uh, fixes your cutoff scale. Okay, so that's another way of arriving at exactly the same inequality. And I think this is a very sensible statement, right? Now, what is the link with Fessinalente? Well, the link with Fessinalente comes about as follows. If I take the weak gravity particle, right? And I also demand, so here is my weak gravity particle with unit charge. It has to obey this relation. But I also insist on it obeying our relation. Then I exactly end up with this thing. So what I get is a logical triangle, right? If I take a combination of two out of three, I get the third one, right? Okay. And what was nice in our calculation, we had a hard time of fixing the coefficient um, from the semi-classical computation. From this argument, if we combine, we, get, we combine it and we say, look, this should exactly, this tr logical triangle should exactly give the Fasina length bound. We can just fix our coefficient and then we get the square root of six here. Okay, so that makes our bound a little bit more precise, which is also useful, right? I also just want to mention that, note how nice this inequality is. We find that, you know, U1 coupling in the sitter space cannot be arbitrarily small. And I think this resonates well with the swampland state, with the swampland bounds about the sitter space, which are very heuristic, that the sitter space should not leave it parametric weak coupling. Of course, there the word coupling can be anything. But if you apply it in specific to the U1 coupling, you know, this one is kind of nicely consistent with it, right? So even if you are a swampland critic, what I think should, I hopefully you can appreciate is like the inner consistency of many of these statements, right? You can arrive at exactly the same inequalities from completely different angles. And that's, I think, when it gets very interesting. All right, here's some technical remarks. What we have also done is we were able, we were able to, um, write down exactly the same logic in case we have a quintessence scenario instead of a uh, the sitter scenario. And the way you look, you try to uh, formulate then the statement is you're gonna look at the question, do there exist charge narrow solutions in a quintessence universe? And it's actually easy to construct them. Um, and then again, you arrive at the same, you know, not I condition at the same Fessina Lente condition, but of course, the question whether I can have charged Nari solutions does restrict my uh, how strong the runaway of my quintessence field can be. So what you find is that the quintessence field has to be, the runaway of the potential has to be bounded by this number. Okay, F prime over F, what is F? F is the running of the gauge coupling. So the moment I have a quintessence field, nothing can prevent me, or a priori nothing can prevent me to write down the non-renormalizable couplings that make the quintessence field coupled to the U1 field, right? And so I need to apply this inequality if I want to say there are charged narrow solutions and hence I get a Festina Lente bound, okay? Let me not go into details about this inequality. This is just asking, you know, that the, the solution is stable, all right? So I get an inequality on the second derivative, right? Uh, here is another, technical remark, but it kind of is important. So for general D, the existence condition, this is this one, for me to, you know, for charged Nari solutions, you know, comes from analyzing electric Nari's, but in D equal four, we can have electric and magnetic Nari solutions, right? And then the condition becomes this inequality. So the signs are not important anymore. It works for any runaway uh, direction of V and of F, okay? So what we did in, a, in another paper that we wrote in between those papers, one of the things we have done is we looked at, you know, charged Nari solutions of quintessence models. And actually we use the opposite of this inequality. This is just a tiny remark, which I found very cute. So what am I trying to say here uh, is the following. So what if this bound goes the other way, right? Then there is no charged Nari solution. Then there's no decider to solution. But given that this bound brings us to arbitrarily, you know, you expect that quintessence bring you, brings you to always weaker and weaker coupling, 
uh, you would say, you know, who knows, we should forbid the existence of exact the zero two solutions. I mean, it's okay if you don't agree with it, but imagine you still keep it as a principle, you know, sort of a no decider swamp land bound. Then what this inequality allows you to do is you can actually constrain the time dependence of the fine structure constant, okay? And here is a constraint we found by demanding this, right? And what is C, C is this typical number that swamp land uh, papers try to bound, right? So it's this thing we all, it has been discussed at length. And here is what we get. And here is what the Oklo nuclear reactor has given us as an experimental bound on the running of the um, fine structure constant. So I don't say we're there yet, but if C is small enough, we can sort of understand why this fine tuning is actually there. So one of the problems with quintessence scenarios is of course this fine tuning. And we're just saying, hey, funny enough, you know, for beating charts not I, <clears throat> you get very close to this fine tuning. But that's just a side remark, okay? Let me skip the discussion with multiple fields because it's very technical. Before I go to Fino, I wanna convince you, you know, uh, why this Fascina Lente bound actually makes quite a lot of sense, apart from there to exist sort of two orthogonal arguments for it. It's uh, sort of similar to the, to the picture I think Tom Rodilius and, and his colleagues tried to, to paint is that if a swamp land bound makes sense, it sort of should behave well under dimensional reduction. That's sort of a self-consistency check. And you can do that in many ways. And we have done three different ways to check that dimensional reduction makes the bound sensible, okay? So here is one way. If you start with a theory without a gauge field, so pure, you know, the sitter space, and you reduce it, of course, you get a Kaluza Klein gauge field. And then you can apply Festina Lente to that gauge field. Okay, so let me skip the details out due to lack of time. So please ignore these formulas in between. I can always explain them. But what you get is this. You get as a consistency condition that the Kaluza Klein mass, because Kaluza Klein states are now charged under this gauge field. So they're, you know, the Festina Lente particles you find that the Kaluza Klein mass has to be large enough. So what is this statement saying? Usually this is a necessary condition for writing down a lower dimensional effective field here in the first place, right? So this is a very nice self-consistency uh, condition that we fulfill. Another option is that you start out in a theory which already has a gauge field in a higher dimension. And then you can check the following. What happens if my particles in the higher dimension obey the Fessina Lente bound? Do they still do so after dimensional reduction? Okay. So here is what you get if you rewrite the Fasina Lente bound in a higher dimensional space time in terms of lower dimensional quantities, right? So what happens is the following, which is kind of nice. If the radion is a runaway, say that you're not in the regime where Casimir energy can stabilize it, then this parenthesis is exactly zero. So the what you get is an exact one-to-one -one relation between the Festina Lente bound in the lower dimension and the Festina Lente bound in the higher dimension. They're just identical. So you should say, okay, what happens if it's bounded by Casimir energy? Then you could say, maybe we get new constraints on light fields. That is correct, but not for the case of interest, right? So when would it be interesting to do, sorry, to apply sort of the same techniques that people said, okay, let's reduce the standard model to three dimensions. You know, what kind of swamp land constraints are telling me something about four dimensional standard model. We cannot do that in our case because there's no charge net I solution in 3D. So this thing becomes less, less nice if you wanna use it as something to generate, you know, new constraints on light fields that then we cannot use it. A third self-consistency condition, which I like a lot is, you know, what if I look at a theory with a higher P form field, okay? It of course gives me a vector upon reduction over enough dimensions. And what we find, which is very nice. So let's for instance, take a two form living in five dimensions. You reduce it to four, you generate a vector. Okay. What you find is that um, the Fessina Lente bound in four dimensions then becomes a bound in, in five dimensions for the string tension. And you found that you know the, the, the radion exactly cancels and you get um, a phi independent constraint uh, for my string tension, okay? So you just get exactly as done for the weak gravity conjecture. So where you can say, okay, mass becomes tension and charge becomes charge. You exactly get the same for the Festina Lente um, um, bound, which is highly non-trivial that it actually works. Okay, so in general, you do that by looking at N brains in N plus four dimensions, right? So I think it's highly non-trivial. This actually worked out and it didn't give us a problem. Thomas, one so, question. Yeah. Quick, quick, nah, one quick question. 
So typically, this weak gravity bounds, I mean, if you saturate them in one dimension, it's true that you can saturate them in lower dimensions when you have supersymmetry. But typically, when you don't have supersymmetry, like some particle that was extremal becomes substremal and so on. So here yeah. that you're in the sitter and you don't have supersymmetry, how, what is the intuition that if you saturate something in one dimension, one dimension, you will still saturate it in lower dimensions? So first of all, I must say, I mean, these inequalities are, you know, probably corrected. I mean, okay, these are the, the effective tensions, right? So there can be corrections due to quantum corrections, which you don't have when you have supersymmetry. Uh, so what I think this just means that, but I'm not sure because we tried it. If you extend this logic of decaying uh, black holes to higher dimensions, say the sitter brains in a higher dimensional the sitter space, and you want those black brains to decay well-behaved, that you end up with the same inequalities. But I'm not entirely sure of this because I think we, we discussed it and kind of has its own difficulties. Yeah. Sorry, Irene, if that's not a okay, fully yeah. satisfying answer. Yeah. Okay, let me, Irene, please truncate me when I'm out of time, okay? I now quickly want to discuss pure pheno applications and then some string pheno applications. And I hope that the string pheno applications hopefully for you count as another argument for Fessina Lente, okay? Yeah, because remarkably, we should, we should finish in five minutes. Um, okay, so I don't know which of the two I should choose. So let me <laughs> just go rather quickly. So all charge fields in the standard model luckily obey Fessina Lente or we were ruled out from the start, okay? And then let us ignore these inequalities. Let's just look at this diagram. So what I've done here is we plotted H and then Planck. And here we plotted the uh, Festina Lente scale, right? So particles with unit charge should be heavier. And just from this picture, let the message be there like, okay, this really helps for constraining hierarchy problems. For instance, if you apply to the electron, you say, okay, the electron exists. How does it bound the vacuum energy? We see that we, you know, bridge 90 of the 120 um, orders, all right? So it's kind of nice. Um, okay. So what you can also show with Fessina Lente, the moment you apply to the Cartan um, generators of a non-abelian gauge group, you also have Narai black holes, et cetera. You start, you know, uh, you also get constraints for young Mills fields. Um, let me just do it from a picture. So this inequality is sufficient. What you can show is that the masses of gauge fields have to be higher than the Hubble scale and the confinement uh, um, energy should also be higher than the Hubble scale. So. What, what in a way to be, you could say that we have postdicted um, the fact that you know the weak force or the strong force they either have to confine or they have to be hixed. If they would not be, we run into uh, contradictions with the standard model, I mean, in, with, with the Fasina Lente bound. Okay. For instance, you can show that you know, the, the Higgs potential could not take this form because that would violate the Fasina Lente bound, and this form is still allowed. But okay, let me not go into too much detail. Let me go to the string pheno applications. So let me skip pure supergravity model building where there is a super nice, this is just, I'm selling something. Just look at the last line. For instance, we found a direct link between the global symmetry conjecture and Fasina Lente, okay? And this goes through the cyber Komargotsky paper. The upshot is if I have constant Fayoyalopoulos terms in supergravity, I violate the global symmetry conjecture as pointed out by these two gentlemen. And you can also show that at the same time, you always will violate Fasina Lente. So there's really a non-trivial, again, link between all these swamp plant conjectures, which makes you sort of trust them that they are at least making sense. Oh, right? sorry, we I'm never confused. get a conflict. I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm confused. This statement is about non-gravitational theory, the, the last one, relation to the zyberg malkowski condition. Right, so here is a statement in an equal one supergravity. The easiest way to get metastable the sitter is by gauging the arch symmetry. Oh, okay, that's why okay. you use gravity, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can show that the gravitino, because it's charged in Majorana, there's not a gauging variant mass terms and to always violate Fesina Lente, which is good because already Cyborg and Komargotsky pointed out that they will always violate the global symmetry conjecture. Oh, okay, okay, good. That's Thank like another, I mean, oh, we find yeah, many links like this, right? So, I'm almost there. So let me go immediately to KKLT. Okay, so let's say something about a famous Sitter scenario. Let me say something about KKLT and then I'm done, right? So with much ado, I don't need to introduce KKLT. I had some nice pictures, but I'm assuming this audience kind of knows it. There's an anti-brain uplifting at a warped throat, et cetera. Okay, so what did we do? We applied both electric magnetic 
with gravity conjecture and Fasina Lente to charge states we, which we could build in, in KKLT models. Okay. To our surprise, this was not done before. Okay. And what are the charge states? We've we constructed two kinds strings that start from the anti D3, move to the bulk brains. And then we also constructed D3 particles wrapping, where you have D3 brains wrapping the cycle at the bottom of the throat, which is filled by three form flux. And then because of the Fried Witten effect, you get M strings sticking out going to the anti D3, okay? So this gives us two kinds of charged particles in the lower dimension that we could apply Fasina Lente, but also all the other, uh, the electric and the magnetic weak gravity conjecture. And here is when I got convinced, when I got found it really surprising. So whenever we applied Festina Lente, and you rewrite it in terms of model building numbers that enter KKLT scenario, we just hit the well-known bounds people already wrote down for the scenario to work. For instance, let us just apply a fell on the D3 particle. We got a condition on the size of the throat uh, with respect to the string scale. Okay, and for instance, you can you know open the recent papers of the Sackler group. These are all necessary conditions if you don't want KKLT to destabilize, you know, the conifold uh, throat or other things, right? And it happened for every one of them that we checked. We each time found an inequality which already existed, which people needed. We knew we had to satisfy in order to find self-consistency of the KKLT setup. So this is something that I found really nice and highly non-trivial that it works. Still, there is an issue that we, well, I don't say there's an issue, but there, we can learn something very interesting from applying the Festina Lente bound. So I'm just gonna say it, and then I'm gonna go to my conclusions. Although I had a few more slides about this particular thing. Okay, so this is all nice and gives us confidence in the Festina Lente bound or in KKLT. The, I mean, it's your, your taste, how you want to look at this, right? However, what it also shows us is the following. So one of the most important assumptions in model building is that I can decouple the SUSY breaking, the formations that I get from inserting an anti-brain in the throat, that I can decouple them from the bulk, right? If you really strongly believe in a decoupling, you eventually can always violate the Festina Lente about. How can you do that? What you can do is you can say, look, my bulk is all very happy. It doesn't know about the SUSY breaking. So I'm going to engineer some non-trivial field theory from a stack of D7 brains. OK? You can do it in a specific way. And then you can always start constructing charged particles, which have charges with respect to these those gauge fields. Sorry. But then I can make chiral models. So I can make my fermions massless. I can have charged massless fermions. And they obviously obey, obey are bound. So what is the way out? The way out is, well, this only is true when we assume no communication between those sectors, okay? When the SUSY breaking goes all the way out of the throat, then I should not trust that calculation, right? So we see it as evidence and that, and I'm just gonna skip it. Or for instance, one of the last, uh, the last um, criticisms on KKLT is that look, there's a highly non-trivial, if you want the citra uplift to work, there's something highly non-trivial happening in the in like a huge portion of the bulk. Okay, this is known as the singular bulk problem pointed out by Gao, Hebecker, and Jungans, and has been discussed before in the seminar series. So I'm not gonna go there. Let me just go to my um, conclusions. Okay. So I think the FL bound, if it's correct, I like it a lot because it's a highly non-trivial UVIR connection. And it's sort of derived, quote unquote, on the basis of principles very similar to the weak gravity conjecture, right? And I had two different sort of um, arguments for it. I also showed that a FL bound can be generalized to many fields, also non-abelian fields, quintessence scenarios, etc. It nicely connects to other more established bounds, right? This is when I, the, the whole framework becomes very rigid. For instance, you can get it from the magnetic weak gravity conjecture or from demanding that you're, you know, ultraviolet cutoff is below, is above the dark energy scale. And then for instance, I showed you that in pure Sugra model building, you even found a link with the no global symmetries conjecture. It survives many self-consistency tests, say via dimensional reduction. And then of course, this is where it gets most interesting and I almost didn't mention it. It can constrain beyond standard model, uh, model building, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, right? So to be a little bit of sort of arrogant, I could say we post that Higgsian and confinement and then for top-down build model building, so within string theory, it actually post takes many of the known consistency relations on KKLT, 
on anti-brain uplifting. But if you trust it, it also implies that the decoupling bulk from the throat will never be possible. So what's up for the future? I think very important would be to really work out um, model building constraints. One issue I didn't talk about, which is hugely important is what about inflation? Okay, is it not strongly in contradiction with inflation? And personally, I would really like to find more arguments for Festina Lente, maybe find a link with the CK inbound. Thank you very much.